Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Whitetail Rendezvous is pleased to announce a partnership with GoHunt.com. Who's GoHunt.com? Well, if you're a DIY hunter, you need the information at GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Why? Because it provides 4,200 profiles, every unit, every species, and every season. Furthermore, they give in-depth analysis, interactive maps, unit access, and seasonal trends. Draw odds are very important, and they give you the most accurate information in the business. All this is available when you go to GoHunt.com forward slash insider. Make sure you use promo code WR when you join Insider. You'll get a $50 gift card for GoHunt.com gear shop. Remember, when you become a member of GoHunt.com forward slash insider, you're going to get a $50 gift card to GoHunt gear shop. What's in the gear shop? The best gear that you can buy for hunting the West. All in all, if you're hunting out West in 2018, GoHunt.com Insider is where you need to be to get all the research information. When you use promo code WR, Whitetail Rendezvous receives a small commission from GoHunt.com. Hey folks, we got a new sponsor. It's called Buck Wild Coffee. What's so special about Buckwild Coffee? Well, a gazillion people go to Starbucks every day and drink coffee. Well, why shouldn't Buckwild Coffee offer you light, medium, or dark roast with free shipping? All you have to do is go to whitetailrendezvous.com, go to shop, and order your coffee. And I'll ship it out for free. Hey, thanks so much for visiting Buckwild Coffee, the best brew in the West, best brew around the campfire, the best brew in the hunting shack, the best brew anywhere. Buck Wild Coffee. Get yours today. Welcome, folks. This is Bruce Hutchin, your host, executive producer of Whitetail Rendezvous. And this is my summer series. This is preseason prep, and I'm very happy to have Jacob Packer on. He's the regional sales manager for Spy Point. What's Spy Point? Well, you're going to hear all about it in the next hour or so. But more important than that, um, we're going to be talking about preseason prep with your trail cameras, of which Spy Point is one brand. Jake, welcome to the show, and let's roll up and 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 talk about you know just the development of the use of spy cameras. Now, you know, security cameras have been around forever, but all of a sudden, motion sensors, white-tailed deer, and uh, we got a huge industry, don't we? Oh yeah, it's. Uh... It's it's everywhere. You you can't uh, you can't be in and around the hunting industry now without seeing trail cameras everywhere. Now, do you know the history of of when this whole thing started? You know, who was the first guy to figure out? Wait a minute, if I can use this in my office, I should hang it on a tree. <laughs> I I can't I can't answer that one for you, but uh, I bet he's uh, sitting pretty and he's killed some big deer with it though. That's for sure. Yeah, because how long? You know, I'm just trying to think. Trail cameras. Being used, it's got to be over 10 years, 10, 15 years, don't you oh, think? Oh, easily, yeah. I know, I know I started hunting. It was 1999 is, is the first season that I really started hunting. And, you know, we had trail cameras in. You know, they were they were 35-millimeter flash cameras, but we used, we still use trail cameras in. So that's been, gosh, uh, 20 years now. So it's uh, well before that, I'm sure. Yeah, uh, and talking to some older, more mature um, hunters, they used to take uh, silk strands and they would yep. put out silk strands on deer trails. <laughs> and they would obviously have to check the silk strand, but they'd have it. And so they could tell, you know, basically they could tell which way the deer was going and they could tell the 12 hour period of time or whatever. So uh, we have been using those those uh, devices, rudiment as, as they are, to to uh, see if deer are using, you know, uh, a certain uh, pathway. You know, military use it all the time, you know, even way before trail cameras. You know, they had trip wires and stuff like that. So you really knew when somebody went by. But having said all that, you know, hunting has used some way of saying, okay, something passed here at some point in time, and that's all about no. 
now, I mean, we can get what's the stuff you can get off a trail camera picture? I mean, it's just, it's just you get whatever you want off there. You know, you know, our cameras just as a basic feature are showing you time, date, and moon phase. As well as you know the image itself, you know pictures worth a thousand words, and you can learn a ton from just analyzing an individual trail camera photo. But the data and information stored within the the picture file itself is is uh, just light years beyond what we what we used to see in trail cameras. Now we're even talking about you can get barometric pressure, you can get wind direction, right? Yep. We already talked yep. about the moon. Um, can we talk about moisture? Do they pick up moisture? Um, you know, if it's raining, foggy, clear, any of that. You know, our cameras do not, as as far as a, as as a data point, but you can you can look in that picture and and see that you know that that much information. What you're looking for is it raining? What's the weather? Cloudy, overcast? That's that's just another clue you can pick out of your trail camera photo. You know, we as hunters tend to focus on the the subject in that picture. We tend to look at the deer or the raccoon or the turkey or whatever's in our picture, and we skip on past it. When there's so much more data in there, we can be looking at with with weather patterns, with with shade, with plant growth, everything that's contained in that picture, just besides the animal that we can look at. You know, one thing that's helped um, I quantify um, uh, barometric change and cold fronts coming through our 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 uh, trail cameras because we all we all knew the cold front a, a 20 30 degree difference in temperature deer will move but you never knew you know how much to move were they moving just a little bit earlier than sunset and sun sun kind of really moving all day all those type of things because you know to me other than the rut if i, I want to see deer i want to hunt a cold front yeah yep for sure yeah you know we you can look at the at your weather forecast or look at what the what the trees and the other wildlife's doing and and plan that hunt out and you know, hunt within 24, 48 hours of that cold front moving through or hunt on the front edge of that storm front, couple that with your cameras and the pictures you're seeing, and you can you can set yourself up really, really well for a hunt that way. Yeah, listen, it's it's important what, what Jake just said, hunt in the front of it. Now, you can hunt on the back end also. It depends on the velocity of, velocity of the storm. But in the, the front, the deer, the deer, all the critters know something's happened because the barometric pressure is changing. And so they know they want to get groceries, they better get groceries. And that's why they're moving, you know. Um, yep. And so, you know, if you have to take off of work when you see a cold front coming, time it out, figure it out, call in sick, and get in your stand. Your thoughts? Yep. No, I agree. And that's something you can start doing this time of year. You know, we see this time of year with our cameras out, if we've got a storm coming in, and we've got tons of storms here, late spring, early summer, you know, you see these storm fronts rolling through. And you start seeing deer out in the bean fields at one, two o'clock in the afternoon because that storm front's coming through. So with my trail cameras, what I like to do is is monitor particular deer this time of year. If I can start telling which particular buck it is, and I got I see, <clears throat> look, in two days I got a storm coming in, according to the weatherman, which who knows if I can trust that or not. But let's take notes this time of year on when that storm comes through and compare that to when that deer starts moving. So when November rolls around and a storm comes a storm front is coming through, you know, I know this, you know, specific 10 point buck, Hey, back in the summer, he moved, you know, 18 hours before that storm. That's when he fed that 12 pointer. He fed six hours before the storm. That's when that deer started feeling that pressure. And that's what pressure activates that specific deer. I can go to my trail cameras and start watching that and patterning that with the storm fronts that are coming through and use that as a, as a time frame and a calendar come November. You know, and folks, you don't need fancy equipment to, to do that. You get, um, you get a smartphone, you make a note, um, you just start building a log, you know, uh, on your deer, your hit list log, because you should be start thinking about it because we're coming out of winter, the horns are starting to grow. And so you're going to get an idea who, who's around, um, and who made it through. And then you're going to start building your hit list because Lefty did make it through. He did make it through the winter. You know that. You found his, his sheds and, you know, he sort of seen a deer that sort of might be him already on a camera anyway. Um, even this early. I mean, there's, there's bone being grown. There's no question oh, yeah. about it. And so when you start doing that, keeping a log so it isn't, hmm, and you have to think about it. You just go, okay, book, log, eight hours before, hmm, I think I'm going to sit that stand. 
I think I'm going to be there. And that's how much this technology has helped us become better hunters because we're more observant. And I know that's helped me become, you know, I'm big into long distance scouting and, and sitting and watching what the deer are doing, when they're doing it, why they're doing it and how they're doing it and what all the other factors are. Because it isn't just going out and sitting in woods. If that's what you want to do, great. You know, and just go sit in your stand and enjoy it. That's wonderful. But your buck hunters, take it a little step further. Yeah, I agree with you. And if you're a, if you're a mature buck hunter and you're not keeping a log, you're not you're not a serious mature buck hunter. Um in in my opinion, you, that that log for you is the is the life of that buck. That's why he does what he does. You know, my trail cameras are a huge part of of how I hunt, why I hunt. I kill some big deer, but you know, that that picture's only showing me part of it. I can I know this buck is here. You know, I I, a few years ago, I killed a 187-inch whitetail, and I knew that buck was in the area. But until I understood why he was in the area when he was there, I couldn't pinpoint exactly when to hunt him. So by looking at my my pictures and my weather patterns and my log that I've kept meticulously on this buck for the last couple of years, I can start putting together that puzzle of why this particular buck is in an area. And when I figure out why he likes an area and why he's there, then I can figure out when I need to go in and hunt that buck. Now, on a mature buck, how many days are you actually hunting that buck? Uh, hopefully one. But, uh, you know, sometimes we're not that lucky. I, I, If I've got a mature buck, you know, the last couple of years there's been a particular deer. He's well up north of 200 inches I've been hunting. Um, and I've hunted that buck a lot of days. You know, I've, I've spent 20 days in the stand on that buck, uh, but he's – He's outdone me, and I haven't been able to piece together exactly why that deer does what. That 187-inch deer, it was the second day that I hunted him, um, and it was in late November. I didn't hunt that spot at all until late November because the conditions weren't right, and it wasn't when that buck wanted to be there. The first time that I guessed he would be there, I was wrong by about three hours, and when I got in and checked my cameras, that buck had been in there three hours before. The second time I hunted, the conditions and everything just fell perfect, and that buck was in there about 20 minutes after I climbed in the stand, and I put an arrow in him. Um, your, your first time that you set an area is your, your best chance to kill that big buck. Cause once you've been in there and put your stink and your scent in there, hey, you're, you're starting to change the game then. Just heard a lot of things about it. One kill of 187 news there. Um, he missed them, checked, checked the card, went back in 20 minutes after being in the stand. So he got, he got into a stand really quiet and his whole setup was real quiet because the buck didn't know he was there or he would have never seen the buck. Is that true? Yeah, that's absolutely true, and it, it was kind of a uh, a cat and mouse game getting into that stand because what I found is if I would go in too early, if I'd get in there at at you know five thirty a.m. an hour before sun up, I would bust deer out going in. So I had to find that sweet spot where the deer were no longer out feeding in the fields; they were in their staging areas going back to bed. They were headed back to their bedding areas at at six thirty seven o'clock in the morning, and I'd sneak in right in there at daylight so I knew I wouldn't spook anything. And yeah, you know, it, it's likely that when I walked in there, I was within a couple hundred yards of that buck while walking into the stand. So why didn't you spook him? Well, in this particular spot, there's a real nice logging road getting into the stand. And, and the stand location, partly where I picked to put that stand in there, uh, I was on the right side of the wind, right? So the, the buck was was upwind of me. He wasn't going to wind me, which is, is 10 times more important than their sight or hearing or anything else. You know, I can get away with some movement as long as he doesn't smell me. But I can go in quiet on this old logging road, stay on the right side of the wind, and get up in that stand. And, and a lot of that goes into making sure I got the white, right wind direction when I go to hunt that stand and hunt that buck, that I'm not going to bust him out of there when I'm in that tight and that close with him. Yeah, so many times people, you know, they just walk into their stand and see what's going to happen. You know, um, I used to park a quarter mile closer to my stand than I do now. Now I just, I park at the farm and just walk over half a mile to get into my stand. Why? Because the deer know before they knew I didn't have, I had no lights on and slammed the door and didn't do anything. They knew I was there. Yep. Yeah. They flat knew I was there. And so it made. Yeah, they're, uh, they're a lot more observant than we give them credit for. You know, when it's dark and we can't see them, we just assume they can't see us a lot of times. And that's just, that's just not the fact. We can uh, fight ourselves in the, in the backside pretty quick doing that. Yeah, that's for sure. Now, you know, early about five minutes ago, you said, you know, you do a lot of things to make sure you're zeroed in on that deer. What what are some of those zeroing things or 
things I call them things on elimination because you figure this out. Okay, eliminate that, eliminate that. And finally, you know, uh, the concentric circles, you're really right at the heart of the deal and you're either going to blow it or you're going to score. So what are some of the things that make up getting to you to that uh, point? Well, for me, I, I like to learn and study the personality of that individual deer. So I'm to the point in my, my hunting career now where, where I pretty much pick a deer at the beginning of the season and that's the deer I want to hunt, you know. I pass up a lot of 140 and 150 inch deer because I want to kill a specific 170 or, or 200 plus like I've been hunting the last couple of years. So this time of year right now, you know, June, July, I'm going to start studying that deer in the patterns. And they're usually not terribly difficult to find those deer this time of year, especially if you're uh, in an agrarian area, anywhere there's, there's soybean fields, you can get out and start glassing them and find your bucks and then go in and put your cameras out. I want to learn the, the habits and the likes and dislikes of that, of that buck. Does he like being around does and fawns? Does he like being around other bucks? Is he agitated all the time, you know, in the pictures? Or his ears always laid back? Is he always covered in flies? You know, what what does that buck like? What doesn't he like? And that starts letting me narrow down where I can look for him, you know, when he sheds that velvet and he moves. We don't get to hunt velvet bucks here in Ohio. So we, once they shed, you know, they're, they're changing. They're going from their... Their, their open cover, which is what I call it in the summertime, you know, their, their beans and open thickets where they don't want to hit their, hit their antlers off everything. Once they lose that velvet, they're going to the thickest, nastiest, heaviest cover they can find if it's a mature buck. So what does he like to bet in in the summer that's kind of like what he likes to bet in the fall? Can I learn from my pictures and learn from scouting that buck what he likes in November in August? And, and the answer for me is usually yes, if I put enough time into it. Um, in, in that specific particular buck, you, you know, I, I want to pattern him. Each deer's got his own personality. Each deer's got something they like. You'll see bucks that like bachelor, bachelor groups, bucks that hate bachelor, bachelor gr- groups. Excuse me, a little tongue-tied. You'll see, uh, you know, bucks that like to group up with big bucks. One big buck likes a group of little bucks. Anything I can learn about that buck starts helping me figure out what kind of deer he is and how I need to hunt him. So every deer has a personality, so you got to figure that out. That takes a lot of observation time. That's what it's telling me. It, it does. It takes a lot of observation time and a lot of studying. Um, and I, I study and observe deer a whole lot more than I hunt them. And that, that's part of the reason that I'm successful in, in harvesting deer, um, you know, especially when I'm not being too picky chasing something 200 inches. Once you get that, that six, seven, eight-year-old deer, that's, that's a very difficult deer to hunt. And uh, they're usually smarter than I am. But, you know, for most guys going out there, you want to hunt a three, four, five, six-year-old deer. <clears throat> You you got to put in some hours to to study and understand that deer if you're going to kill them without just getting lucky, uh, which which not to downplay luck. You know we all need to be lucky in our in our hunting scenarios, but to be educated hunters and educated people and and understand whitetail behavior, under, understand animal behavior in general and deer behavior by observing, looking at camera pictures, watching during the summer, taking every little piece of information we can is how we build up that that case to go and hunt that deer. So we see the deer, we observe the deer, we're writing down all his, all his angles. Now it comes, okay, when, you got to make a choice. When's the go time on this deer? Well, and yeah, and that's, uh, you know, a lot of that depends regionally where you're hunting. You know, if I'm hunting in, in Kentucky, which isn't too far for me, um, I'm going to be out there the, the first weekend season opens because the deer's going to be in their summer patterns and in velvet. Um, if I'm hunting Ohio, I usually don't go after a deer, um, until late October, early, late November, just depends on what that deer, what that area, what the does in that area are doing. But, you know, I, I might give up a month of season so I don't bust that buck out in October. Because I'm, I'm not going to kill a mature buck in October. It, it's not, I'm not going to kill him October 10th, October 12th. You know, when he's in that nocturnal nighttime phase and the thickest, nastiest cover he can be in, and he's only got to move 100 yards a day to have food, cover, and water. If, if that's all he needs and he doesn't have to move, I'm not going to get in that quarry area and kill him. I don't want to bust him out, so I'm going to wait till the conditions are right on my side based on whitetail behavior and based on the environment and what's going on before I go in and hunt him. Well, the rut kind of sort of starts around, you know, Halloween-ish. Peak times could be the 7th, the 10th, the 11th, the 12th, you know, just depending where you're at. Um, yeah. So if you're hunting late November, that's, you know, the tail end of the rut, or maybe the rut's gone and you're waiting for the next estrus cycle, uh, you know, to come through. So why why late November? Well, late November has been a, a 
kind of a sweet spot for me where I'm at. And one thing about the whitetail rut um, that I've noticed and observed and something I've studied over my years of hunting whitetail is uh, I call it the 28-day cycle, right? So a whitetail deer's estrus cycle is 28 days. So every 28 days is when she's going to come into heat. So mid-October to late October, I might be in the woods a little bit, starting to look for those little football scrapes that the young bucks kick up when they get that first whip of of pre-estrus. You know, the cycle before that doe comes into estrus, it's going to whip those young bucks up. I'm going to base my hunting time off of that. So if I start seeing those football scrapes pop up, you know, October 1st, hey, I'm going to hunt November 1st. I'm going to hunt that that one-week period that's 28 days after when those football scrapes start popping up. That's just where they tend to be where I'm at. This particular herd, they seem to move more and rut more in late November than they do early, early November. If I go and, and drive an hour north uh, to one of my other hunting spots, you know, it, it's Halloween morning's a great time to hunt. Get out there on October 31st, 1st, 2nd. It all just depends on what that doe cycle is doing. And, and, and that goes back into understanding white-tailed deer behavior and genetics and, and how they work even more. You know, we can we can generalize when the rut's going to be every year. You know, I can look at a calendar and pencil in now for the next five years when I think the rut's going to be and be pretty accurate. You know, by by going October 31st through the first seven days of November, I can bet pretty good that's going to be good hunting. But if I'm only only hitting in on those most mature, hardest to kill bucks, oldest bucks that are in there, I really, really want to crunch down exactly exactly the days i mean to a four-day period is what i look for a four-day period of when i want to hunt that specific buck and i'm going to do that by finding when the does are in estrus when they're in heat and in the area i'm hunting these big bucks at that just seems to be late november is when they're when that herd comes in and that's due to the 28-day estrus cycle of a doe so october 1st you see football size scrapes or just you know guys just learning what the whole thing is and then the first of november can be a little bit different because now you got two and a half, three and a half year old deer, you know, mixing it up and, and, yep. you know, your rub lines are out and, and there are scrapes that are, are bigger than the footballs. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and a lot of that movement says two and a half and three and a half year old deer, which don't do anything for me. I mean, I, I love seeing them. I love watching them, but I'm not going to go put human scent in the woods and mess up my hunting spot after a two and a half or three and a half year old deer. I'm going to wait for everything to just be perfect. And you, you know, that, biggest mature buck he's not going to run himself any harder than he has to he's been around he's seen how the game works he's not going to chase a a doe that's four days away from being in heat he's going to get on her you know that 36 to 48 hour period before she's in heat and stay with her through that so that's when i want to be hunting because that buck's smart enough to know you know he can smell in the air yeah she's not quite there yet i need to wait a little bit longer before i waste my energy up there chasing her and going after another deer and uh that's that's how I'm, I'm basing off a particular deer when I'm hunting it. So now you, you've got your four days, you know, what stand do you decide what that you're going to use? You know, what's your setup? I'm, I'm hunting the doe. So if, if uh, you know, if, if I'm feeding corn somewhere, you know, I might be hunting, you know, within a hundred yard perimeter where that corn is, where those does are going to stage at. But what I'm going to do is look for bedding areas. So if, if I know where my does are bedding at, which I usually do, because right now I can find where my does are, are fawning at, where are they having their fawns, where are they tucking them away at, and look for those kind of areas where the bedding area is going to be. The does pattern is not going to change as much as the bucks are. So I'm going to figure out where those does are bedding, and then come November, I'm going to wait for the conditions to be right, and I'm going to hunt about 100 yards on the downwind side of that bedding area, and that's where I'm going to pull that big buck from. Because that big buck's going to walk down there, He's going to scent check that bedding area from about 100 yards down to see if anything's hot in there to see what's been in there. He's still going to come in cautious with the wind, and I want to be right there on him where he's going to come in with that wind. And hopefully there's some kind of terrain feature there that that helps me funnel him in a little bit better. But generally, you're going to find that big buck coming in within 100 yards downwind of the bedding area. So he's going to circle around, scent check it. He's not even going to mix it up. And then if he finds the dough, then he's going to go to work. Yeah, he's, he's going to go in and check. And if, if he can smell, hey, there's no does in heat here, I'm not, he's not, you know, you're not going to see a seven and a half year old buck out there chasing a doe that's not in heat. If he's chasing her, it's because he's, she's in heat. So if he's going to come down, scent check, see if anything's worth his while. If it is, then he might go in and bust that, or he might go in and start tracking that doe or finding her if he knows that doe, where she's going to feed at and where she's going to bed at and start hanging around that area more and more and more as she gets in heat. But if he comes by that area and checks it and nothing's in there, he's going right back to his core area and, and waiting uh, waiting for go time. So it's a mystery. It's a, 
you know, it, it's really hard because I'm I'm thinking just, you know, some of uh, the bucks that we haven't got. You see them on the trail camera in August and go, oh, man, oh, man, you know, there's some big deer here. Then they flat out disappear. And what you're saying makes sense because they're not really moving at all. Yeah, that that's that's been my my experience with it. And through a little bit of case study with with older mature bucks that I haven't been wanting to wanting to kill, you know, I'll go into their core areas and I'll put up one of our, our cellular trail cameras, which uh, I'll, I'll kind of lead into a little bit. It's called the Link S. And the reason I like this camera is it's cellular and it's solar. So I never have to change batteries and I never have to check the card. I can take this camera into a buck's core area right now in June or July when he's not using that core area because it's too thick and it's too nasty and he don't want to buff his antlers. I can go in and set that camera up and I might not get a picture for two months because that buck's not going into the core area. But because I've, I've, I've hunted and I understand the, the way a whitetail works, I can pretty much find where a core area is going to be on that whitetail, what major and minor trails are coming in and out of it. Put that camera out now come watch the rut and see how much that buck really leaves that core area. It might not be very much. He might wait for a doe to come to him. You know, he, he might venture out after a doe. <clears throat> if one's close by, bring her back into that, that core area and stay there. Those big mature bucks are smart and they know the sanctity and, and cover that that core area provides them is somewhere they want to stay. And by putting those cameras in there this time of year, we can watch and monitor the deer in those core areas later in November without going in and busting them out and giving human center, kicking them out of the air bedding area, you know, at two in the afternoon or whatever our strategy was to get into that core area. We can now leave it alone. And our camera has basically made itself part of their, their core area without them ever knowing. In the intro, I mentioned that we were going to talk about this exact uh, topic. Uh, when do you stop checking your cards? You don't have a Wi-Fi system. You don't have a, you know, an up, upload system. So when do you stop pulling cards? Yes, yeah, so it, it depends on where it is and, and what the particular camera's purpose is. So if it's, you know, this camera that's on a core area, I'm never going to check it. I'll go in there a year from now. You know, I put out three cameras this weekend that I will not touch until summer of next year. They're going to stay out there all year long. They're going to send me pictures to my phone so I can monitor my deer activity. But I'm done with that area. I'm not going to hunt it. It is strictly to monitor what the deer are doing and, and watch those specific deer's behavior. Um, as far as checking cards, you know, if it's a place I'm feeding, I'll put out an on cellular camera because I know I'm going to go back in there and put out more corn or put out a, a salt block. You know, I'll put out one of my non cellular cameras and I'll check it every time that I go in and feed. If it's a, a camera over a trail or a camera leading into a bedding area or a natural feeding area, um, you know, hopefully I run a cellular camera. But if I'm in an area where I'm not running a cellular camera, I don't, say I don't get cell coverage or, you know, I bought, uh, you know, our, our Force 10 camera is kind of our workhorse non cellular camera. I've got a ton of those things out and I'll check those right up until about the second week of October, because by that second week of October, I'll have figured out probably when those small football scrapes start popping up. And once those scrapes start popping up, I'm not hunting it until it's been been 28 days from then. OK, so you mentioned the second time about the football size scrapes. So mm -hmm. they are the size of football and, and the rubs is going to be small on saplings, saplings. You'll see them pop up football side scrape so that's when you take out your notebook take some pictures and go okay and throw it into your harvey your journal and, or keeping your log on your pc okay here's the date here's the time here's the location and you can pin it right on google earth i mean it can't doesn't get any easier than that and but those are your mature immature deer year and a half maybe two and a half years old because i don't think three and a half four years old guys are, are out and about yet quite yet doing that stuff it's the first whiffs of the pheromones and testosterone going oh my goodness oh my goodness <laughs> yeah the young, young guys remember how exciting last year was they're, they're, uh, <laughs> kid, kid before he goes to amusement park you know he's excited he's got to get some energy out and he starts making those scrapes and one of the telltale things about those little scrapes that, that, that I've talked about a few times now is they never get revisited and you know guys we, we've all seen these where we go out in the woods and we see this scrape pop up we hang a camera over it and we put some some mock scrapes and stuff in it and, and sit there and watch it. It never gets touched again. And that, that's because that's not the purpose of that scrape. That's not why the deer makes that scrape. It's just an antsy, ornery little buck who got his first whiff of almost estrus and he's just getting some aggression out. And uh, that that's just his behavior. That's what, what he's naturally driven to do. So uh, 
you know, it can be a very unproductive place to to hunt or to put a camera. Uh, I, Here's a hot special for all Whitetail Rendezvous listeners. The Hunting Buddy app is given away and all expenses paid. Free range whitetail hunt at ABC New York Ranch this fall. You'll be hunting with NASCAR driver Spencer Boyd and the Hunting Buddy team. All the while being filmed by a professional film crew from Rush Outdoors as seen on the Pursuit Channel. To enter the contest for free, go to huntingbuddyapp.com. Click the huge Hunt Giveaway section tab and download the app. When you upgrade to the Outfitter plan, you get 30 additional giveaway entries. Hunting Buddy app is your best choice for staying safe in the woods with their patent-pending safety notification system. So lunar information including peak game, activity times, current and future weather forecasts, land ownership, hunting waypoints, group hunting, and so much more, all for free from Hunting Buddy app. That's H-U-N-T apostrophe N B-U-D-D-Y app. Especially if your goal is to kill something bigger than the one and a half or two and a half year old deer but it does let you know one there's a buck in the area which is good yeah no the, there's nothing wrong with that and you know that um 28 days later so you know things should get serious and so i should see new scrapes opening up and not just scrapes on the field one thing folks you know scrapes on the field are typically at night I'm not going to say 100% because nothing's 100%, but typically the licking branches and and scrapes, even a, a good size scrape, is typically made at night, and you'll never see that deer. Correct or not correct? No, I agree completely. And, you know, I've put, put cameras over hundreds of scrapes over the last, you know, 10 plus years, and it, it's almost all nighttime activity. You know, if, if you want to find a, a scrape to hunt, that you want daytime activity, look for something off the side of a trail that leads from, from food to bed or, uh, you know, a secluded wooded meadow, you know, those little 200 yard pockets of, of field edges or, or, or something small, something secluded that's going to give that deer cover, security and sanctity during the middle of the day when it's uh, feels it's most vulnerable. What about community scrapes? Let's, let's just stay on the scrape thing. Yeah. Community scrapes. I've seen community scrapes being in my living room. I mean, you go, what the heck happened here? And if you're in hog country, you go, geez, they rooted up this whole thing. Well, I wasn't in hog country, and yeah. it's just a community scrape, and you're just going, oh, my word. What's going on there? You know, you know, I've, I've always called those Walmart scrapes because they're you know, they kind of <laughs> got everything. Everybody goes there. You know, we all go to Walmart at some point, but for whatever <laughs> reason is, who knows? You know, you might be going to buy camo or laundry detergent. <laughs> and, and the reason that, that particular deer is at that at that community scrape, you know, it, it could be a doe walking by, it could be a big buck showing off, it could be anything. And the telltale signs that are in there are in the in the scents and, and glands and everything else that a white tail leaves behind when it walks and when it visits a scrape. And that's they're communicating everything to each other in those scrapes. You know, it's the it's the Facebook of the woods. They're just showing everything that they got right there in the middle of that scrape. And deer are social animals. You know, they like to talk to each other. They like to communicate. They're secluded to a point where they're not always, they're not a herd animal. They're not hanging out in big herds all the time. But when they have the opportunity to talk, they're going to pass by there and they're going to talk. So when I see a big community scrape like that, I know I'm in an area where a lot of different deer are traveling, a lot of different deer are showing up from all different, you know, all different attitudes, all different habits. Every kind of deer is kind of passing through this, this uh, passing through the Walmart. Now, is it a good place to set up a stand? I, it can be, um, you know, I've, I've seen some of my experience where, where you know, I, I put a camera on it. That, that's one of my first things. I'm putting a cellular camera on it when I find this so I can start monitoring right away and I don't have to go back in there. I've seen those community scrapes where, you know, a deer's in there at one or two in the morning and that's the only time. And I've seen other times where they're in there just all day long. You know, the, the rutting's going on crazy around it. Uh, you've got to learn, again, it goes back to deer behavior, which is the number one, number one reason People kill deer because they understand deer behavior. And if we can understand why these deer are visiting the scrape, then we can understand if it's a, a huntable scrape, a daytime scrape, a nighttime scrape. You know, who knows what it is until we really start learning our particular deer. I know uh, I mentioned that 187 inch buck that I killed a couple years ago. Uh, there was a really big community scrape right on the edge of that property. And I put a camera on it. And over the course of two years, I've still never had a daytime picture on that scrape. 
It's a scrape that's there all year long. It's always active. I've never had a daytime picture there. So they hang out at the bar. Forget Walmart. It's, you know, Texas Road, yeah. Roadhouse. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. Oh, that's that's funny. That's funny. I, I hope, folks, um, you're getting as much out of the show as I am from Jake. Cause, you know, we're we're having fun with this thing. But you think about all, all the sign, because the, here's the thing. All the sign is there. It's up to you to figure out what the heck it means. The deer is telling you everything you need to know to kill them. But it's up to you to figure out. When you say, gee, I just can't find him and I can't do this, can't do that. He's already told you where he is. Now you just got to figure it out. That's that's what makes whitetail hunting to to myself is is great because all of a sudden you, you figure a little of this out, little of that out, then you then you're on them, and then I know guys they're really good hunters and they've killed a lot of deer, but they don't always hit them. You know, one buddy he, he was in a stand last year in Kansas. He was in a stand, in a stand, in a stand, got out of a stand, and goes back to the same stand because knew it's a good stand. Like 10 minutes after he walked out of the stand, left the stand at the 200, 180, a large deer, very large deer, walked right underneath the stand. How does, how does that work? You know, how does that, that work? That goes with the luck portion. That, that happens, uh, happens to me all the time, it seems like. When I, whenever I leave a stand just a little bit early, he's always in there right after I go. But you know, we Was can, he sitting there watching? watching? Was he just, yeah, just watching you? I don't know. You know, I've seen bucks that are, that are curious bucks. and I was hunting public land one time. I was probably about 17 years old and I dropped my, I had a, a one of the old bear paw releases and I had that, that release in my hand and I dropped it and it flanked off the, the bottom portion of my old man climbing tree stand. It made just a huge loud metal on metal noise through the woods and a deer came in almost on a dead run to see what that noise was. And that curiosity just spurred him and he had to see what it was. Um, I've seen, seen times, you know, where I've, shot a squirrel and had an arrow sticking in the ground. The deer's got to come up and sniff that arrow when it goes by. You know, they're curious animals. So, you know, who knows? Maybe we make a noise and the deer comes to see what it was or there's no telling. Maybe it's just bad luck. Yeah. It, but, but it's a, a, to me, it's just amazing. I think, you know, for that deer to come within 10 minutes, he could have been and probably was less than 100 yards from his stand, you know, when he got down. You know, yeah, that's amazing. It, I just amazing say, how they do that to us. You know, that, that's all part of the fun and the game of, of hunting whitetails and uh, the frustrations half the fun once, you, once you've got one down. Yeah, but everybody, I think everybody, hearing my voice and Jake's voice, you underestimate how close you are to some really good deer every time you're in the field. And good deer, that's a 150 above, a four-and-a-half-year-old deer or, or better. Um, how close you really are because they typically are there. Now you might have a farm that, you know, you just brown it down and they never get that old. But if you let the deer grow, there are old age class deer that you never see, but they're right there. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, it's, uh, you know, and I think if we treat the woods when we go in, like we're always around deer, we're going to see more deer. Cause when we go in, you know, like you said, you're within 150, 200 yards of deer, probably almost the whole time that you're that you're hunting. If you're in good whitetail country, you know, especially if you're hunting hardwoods, there's always deer close by somewhere. Um, and a lot of times we make the mistake of going in thinking, oh, they're out, you know, they're out feeding or they're not to their bedding yet. Or we we think we have more freedom in the woods to to make a little noise and get away with some some poor scent control and stuff like that. And deer are busting us that we never know are there because we never know they're there. We might not know that they're there when we're hunting, when we're doing everything right. They might be within 100 or, or 75 or even closer than that, depending on how thick the cover is. They might be real, real close to us, and we never know they're there. So we also got to use that to take into consideration. How many deer are we spooking that we never know are there? And I think the answer is is probably a lot higher number than deer that we do know we spook. Yeah, it'd be nice to, uh, I know it wouldn't be legal, but get an infrared camera, put it up on a drone, and then go sit in your stand, launch that, have your buddy launch it. And then do a, you know, do a 200, 100, 200, 300, 400 yard, you know, loop around and just see how many, how many blips you get on the screen. You'd, you'd be astonished. I, I think you'd really be astonished. Yep. I agree with you completely. And especially in, in good whitetail country, anywhere across the Midwest and anywhere there's deer, there's a lot of deer, whether you see them or not, they're there. Yeah, that's for sure. 
let's let's get back and and, and talk about uh, public versus private use of uh, trail cameras. We have more and more people. I live out west, and more and more people are dropping you know cameras into their honey holes for elk and, and mule deer, and uh, for that matter, um, uh, bears and stuff in the fall. And when you look at that, um, there's pros and cons to it. So let's 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 spend some time and talk about uh, DIY out in the west using trail cameras. Well, I, I hunt out west a lot, and it's always DIY public land when I hunt out west. And, and I can you sympathize with the struggle of somebody who's going to take, you know, this two or three or four hundred dollar piece of equipment and, and leave it out there in the field. You want to get that information. That information is valuable to us. That's why we put cameras out so we can learn when and where we're supposed to be hunting and what's there. And when we, when we start talking about out west and or even public lands here in Ohio, you know, the number one concern for anybody is going to be theft of theft of your camera, theft of your tree stand, theft of whatever you got. Um, you know, fortunately, there's some steps we can take to to avoid that theft um, or avoid people even seeing seeing our cameras because they, they see a camera, they assume, it's just human nature to assume somebody's hunting here and somebody's hunting here because it's a good spot. So, you know, somebody's seeing your camera, they, they might leave it alone, but they might, you know, hone in on your spot that you hiked back, you know, two or three miles back out west, you know, and found this this perfect flat or an old burn where the elk and the mule deer are, and you got your cameras up. You know, maybe somebody else is out there in a time where they're not looking for animals. They're just looking for, for people sign. They're looking for tree stands or old hunting blinds or whatever else. They're trying to take a shortcut and they see our camera. You know, that might give them the inkling, Hey, that's where they want to hunt. Um, what I like to do when I'm hunting out, out West um, or even public land here, is I get my camera at least 10 feet up in a tree. It's always 10 feet up in the tree and kind of angled down. And what I do is I take three climbing uh, screw in steps with me into a tree or some public lands you can't use screw in steps you got to use this kind that are straps uh, just take those with me put those three on the tree that I want my camera to be on climb up those and reach the, the top as high as I can to angle that camera down where I want it to be at point that camera and take those steps out one I'm eliminating the fact that people are going to see it because nobody's looking 10 feet up in the tree while they're out in the woods you know you you might get that guy who's looking up and sees it but it's it's less likely that somebody's looking 10 feet up in a tree when they're walking through the woods. So I've got that, that hidden bit. I'm also going to hide it from the animals a little bit. You know, they might not see the, the infrared glow or, or whatever else. I'm still going to get a good view of the trail that I'm using. Um, but the odds of somebody else packing in three screw and steps to go up and steal my camera are a little bit lower. Uh, I always out West, always use bear boxes, uh, steel boxes. You know, we make a, a universal box that fits all of our cameras. You stick your, your camera inside the steel box, run your, your python lock through it, and get that up in the tree. I'll keep the bear, hopefully, from destroying it. Some of those big grizzly bears, I'm sure, can, can rip one apart, but that's just part of the, the nature of the beast. But um, And then hunting out west, you know, I go back to using uh, the antenna. You know, I, I know we talked about that on the uh, the Facebook Live portion uh, before we did the podcast was was these, these booster antennas. When I go out west, I've usually got Verizon coverage everywhere I go out west. It's spotty, but I've usually got it. Uh, Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, Montana. I've usually got Verizon coverage, but it, it might be no bars to one bar. If I put one of these 16 foot booster able coaxial antennas on my trail camera, screw that into the side, it gets me two or three bars. That's going to keep me enough to where I'm still going to get those pictures on my, on my cellular cameras out there. Um, and you know, we're talking DIY public land. We're back in the back country a little bit a lot of times and there's, there's not that cell coverage back there, but I also don't want to hike back there. 10 times a year and check my camera. So if I can find any way to utilize cellular technology to send me those pictures, I'm going to do that for sure. Now, when you're DIY in Colorado, uh, Wyoming, um, over the counter tags or drawer tags, or, you know, how, how do you make sure you get back in the same place? Because, you know, it takes a lot of work to put in 10 trail cameras. Yeah. So where I hunt out in Wyoming, I can draw with no points every year uh, or, you know, 90% draw with no points every year. So I can leave those cameras out. No, you, you know, we, we did a, a mule deer and antelope, uh, a boot camp basically this year here in Ohio, where we brought in, we had 40 guys show up and we, we went over, you know, how to draw the tag. Here's the equipment you need. And then I say, look, this is when I'm going on the hunt. I'll be there October 18th through 21st. Anybody who wants to come hunt with me is welcome. You guys put in and draw this tag, come out to my camp. I'll take you out and I'll show you this area, but I've got my area I like there in Wyoming to hunt. Now, I also build points in a lot of states, and when the time comes that I draw one of those coveted, you know, limited entry tags, I'm going to go out there in, in June or July 
and put out a bunch of cameras for my hunt in September and, and have those cameras, you know, I'm in Ohio and it, that, that's a sacrifice for me to go out there. But when I get that good tag, I'm going to take my cameras out there, you know, this time of year, figure out where I think the elk or the deer or whatever are going to be come the fall. And I'm going to have those cameras out starting to send me information uh, so I can learn a little bit while I'm back here at home working. Yeah, that's a huge, you know, people are going to be listening to the show to go, holy Christ, what an investment. But the payoff is you already got all your intel. And, folks, if you've never driven all night, gotten to where you wanted to get, gas a car, get all your groceries, you're heading to a trailhead, and then you look, the sun comes up and you go, oh, my goodness, where are we going to hunt? Even though you figure it out. Just the logistics of getting in and getting out, um, you know, that's why hunting out west without it, you know, DIY is so tough because it takes, it literally takes years to learn where the elk are at one point in time. We talked about whitetail, specific points of year, elk are in one area. And if you're in 10 square miles, 100 square miles of area, let's say, of where they're hanging, then they're only in 10% of it at any one time. And that could be five square miles. You know how big five square miles is or 10 square miles, okay, because of the, the food source or, or, or whatever. That's where they are. And so you have to figure out during your hunt where those elk are going to be in that 10%. That's the hard part of elk hunting. Elk hunting, you know, it's exciting and you get up on them. I'm not trying to be, you know, um, anything. I want to stay humble here, but... But once you figure out where the elk are, then it's it's just a game like whitetail. There they are. The vocalization, they'll tell you where they are. Then you're either going to blow it or you're not. I mean, they're going to make a fool of you or, or you're going to close the deal. It, it's still hard hunting. But the hardest part of elk hunting is finding the elk. That, that's the whole, the whole key thing. Even in limited entry, even when you know you're within a half a mile of a gorgeous bull elk. Yep. You know. And, and. You know, I, I'm no master elk hunter by any means. Believe me, I, I, uh, I'm a, I'm a pretty decent deer hunter, but I'm nothing for elk yet. Uh, but you know, like you're talking about finding when we're elk hunting, finding the elk is the hardest part. Once you found them, then the hunts on, and that's the fun part. Finding them kind of sucks. But if I put cameras out this time of year and there's no elk on them, hey, at least I've eliminated a spot. You know, my strategy to go on an elk hunt is to find you know, five areas that I can go into during the course of this hunt and start eliminating where the elk are not at. So if I can have a camera eliminate three of those spots, hey, there's no elk here. Well, I know I got to go in and get my camera. I'll, maybe, maybe not. Go in and get my camera, but I'm not going to waste any time hunting there because there's no elk there. You know, maybe the, the lack of the lack of information I'm getting at might be a might be a, a vital piece of information. Yeah. No, it, you know that's good because you know elk. The best elk sign is the squishy, you know, um, scat poop, whatever you want to call it. It's just green. And it's it, it's <laughs> It's uh, it's still simmering and it squishes you in your hand and you just kind of put it on your boots and you know you become an elk because the hunt's on they're they're no more than a quarter of a mile away from you those round hard you know <laughs> tootsie rolls not good at all <laughs> they're just they're just not good at all now you talk about mule deer hunting do you do you put up cameras where you mule deer hunt also. Yeah, so I do, and actually, something I did this year. I've I've got a couple of cameras boxed up uh, to where I mule deer hunt. I, I met a guy out in Wyoming a few years ago. I was hunting, and I'm I'm shipping in these cameras, and he's going to go put them out for me. So um, last year, I, I rifle hunted it. It was region Y in Wyoming. I, I rifle hunted it, and we kill bucks every time we go there. But I was able to go on a scouting trip last year in the summer. Uh, I took my wife and my kid, and we went up in the went up in the Bighorn Mountains for a little bit, and then, uh, camped up there, and then camped down in the plains just above KC for a couple of days. I found some really, really nice bucks in the summer. I mean, talking 170, 180, 190 inch bucks, which in region Y is really, really good in Wyoming. Um, and I found these bucks and I found one of them again when I went back rifle hunting. Uh, and it got it got shot right off the road on opening morning. Uh, but my goal this time is is to have these cameras out where I, I saw the groups of bucks last year. I want to see if they're using those same trails. And I've got an elk hunt mid-September in Montana, and I'm hoping to drop down to Wyoming for two days. I'll just have two days to mule deer hunt there. But if, if these bucks are where they were last year, hopefully these cameras will show me, and I can I can pop down there on that hunt and uh, fill an archery tag real quick. Now, are you archery hunting in Montana? 
Yeah, yeah, archery hunt. Now, I've, I've just got a general elk tag in Montana, so I'm an archery hunt, and if I don't kill that, I'll be able to go back later in the year and, and uh, hunt during the rifle season as well. Yeah, what's, what region, east, middle, west of Montana? I don't want to know your honey holes. Just Yeah, well, I don't have any honey holes for elk, so hopefully maybe somebody will uh, see this and, and tell me, but, uh, I, you know, southwest Montana is where the, where the elk population seems to, to be most prevalent. I found a few spots on there that are, kind of back country you know it'll take a day or two to get back um to really really get back in there to where i want to hunt um i'm still kind of weighing my options and if i want to go back into these areas and, and have to pack an elk out of it if, if it's if it's uh possible more than than worth it but uh i'm still kind of weighing my way my options and looking around where i'm gonna end up on that elk hunt but it's probably gonna be somewhere southwest south central uh west central montana yeah just watch the bears yeah, yeah, it seems like there's a lot of those, but that's that's all right. I've hunted around bears and uh, never grizzlies though. Grizzlies seem a little bit bigger, so we'll uh, that'll be yeah, exciting. Yeah, they're just bigger. That's all. They're just bigger. <laughs> if if they want your elk, just give it to them. <laughs> yep, yep. Bear sprays just for getting away, so they want the elk, they can have it. I, I believe actually Montana gives you if you uh you can document you know a bear gets on your elk, a, a killed elk will actually issue another tag. Yeah, just take pictures yep. and. You know, do yep. all this, do all the stuff and, and everything. Boy, this has been, this has been friend, uh, friend, this has been fun, Jake, you know, talking about, um, you know, the hunting and we talked a lot about hunting. Let's, let's take a minute or two and, and give people some high points of, of, uh, spy point and, you know, why you're one of the leading brands, you know, in the marketplace and we'll end the show with that. Yeah. Well, you know, spy point has always been kind of the, the leader in innovation and technology in the trail camera market. And, you know, right now we see that the trend toward trail cameras, everything's going to cellular. And from experience, I can tell you, once you get one cellular trail camera, that's all you're going to want to have is cellular trail cameras. Because, you know, the fact that I'm getting notifications on my phone while we're sitting here doing this interview, that I've got trail cameras taking pictures, it's cool. No yeah. way, no it's way. Is those those yeah. bling? Bing? Yeah. Were yeah. those the bing? Yep. Well, that was, that was an email. My phone's oh. sitting here right next to the computer. It buzzed and showed me the notification. You know, I've, I've got a dozen of these cameras out right now this time of year and you know, starting to watch the fawns and stuff like that. So it's cool to see that. And, it, it, you know, it all goes back to understanding animal behavior, understanding why an animal does what it does. And, you know, spy point trail cameras and the, the technology in the trail cameras, there's, there's no other tool out there that can give me so much information on deer without me actually being in the woods. Um, you know, our, our, uh, kind of front runner leading cameras, the Link Evo at 249 bucks, you're going to sell your camera. You know, it's up and running free unlimited data for the first month that you got it. Um, and get that out there and use that as, as kind of a virtual hunting guide for you and show you when the deer are where, when the elk are where, whatever you're hunting. Having that camera send you that information is, it's unbelievable. Once you, once you start getting it, you won't understand how you, how you hunted without having one of these cameras, you know, sending you the information and, and seeing this at home, not having to go out and check trail cameras. Um, you know, our flash range, we got the fastest trigger speed of any camera out there. 0. 0.07 seconds is the trigger speed on our cameras. We're catching pictures of birds in mid flight, you know, little songbirds that fly by the cameras and they're in the middle of a wing flap and the camera will catch that right in the middle of the camera. And, you know, sometimes you get those deer running by, you get, you know, buck chasing a doe and they can zip in and out of that camera range in a, in a flash, you know, well in under a second. And having that quick trigger speed that's going to catch that, uh, catch that photo for you is, is the difference between getting a photo with information in it versus getting a blank picture of grass. Uh, the, the solar technology is something, you know, alone, we're the only trail camera company you're going to see with an integrated solar panel on your trail camera. Our non-cellular version of the solar, uh, you can actually run that with no batteries in it at all. It just runs solely off the, the solar panel on that camera. And there's nothing more frustrating than going out to check a trail camera and realizing your battery's been dead for three weeks. You know, you, you leave that camera out in your honey hole and you go out there and check it. Oh, it hasn't taken a picture in three weeks. Uh, having that security of those solar panels on the cameras is, is, is invaluable to me. Um, and then, and lastly, something we haven't talked about, but, but, but Everybody, you can go to go to spypoint.com and and click on Buck Tracker. And Buck Tracker is the new software that that SpyPoint's developed this year. And what that does, it's it's free with your account, free through my SpyPoint account, uh, which is a free account with the purchase of your camera. You go on there, it's going to show you a calendar view on the computer or just a layout view on your phone of all the pictures that your camera's taken. It's going to tell you, so say on the desktop view, 
I, it's going to say, you know, if you took 173 pictures today, there's four icons now up the top you can, you can click on. There's a star, a picture of a buck, a picture of a doe, and a picture of a turkey. And if I go in and click on the buck icon, the software is automatically going to pull out just the buck pictures for me. So all I'm going to have to sort through is just the buck pictures. The software uses antler recognition technology, so it, it can actually go in there and, you know, use the intelligence in the software to go in and pull out the buck pictures, line those up for me, and I can just start studying those particular bucks that I want to see. If I click the doe icon, it's going to filter out all the deer pictures. So I'm not going to see the squirrels on my feeder or the raccoons on my feeder or the coyotes or whatever else I don't want to see. And then we just lost here in the 1st of May, um, actually, the, the turkey tracker icon. So you can go in and click turkey, and it'll filter out just the turkey pictures. And so you just the turkey pictures. So, uh, you know, if you run a lot of cameras like I am, or you run them over a feed site or a bait site, having that buck tracker, you know, I get a 1,000 pictures a day sent to my phone. And as cool as cellular technology is, it's kind of a pain to go through a 1,000 pictures a day. But if I want to see bucks, uh, even now, you know, three, four-inch tall antlers, I'm seeing buck trackers start to filter those antlers out and just show me when my bucks are coming in and I can start breaking down and pinpoint based off that software. So those are just some kind of key points of spy point. Uh, all our cameras are two-year warranty. Uh, they're quality made, they're durable, they're compact, they're lightweight, they're everything that you want in a trail camera. What other products do you have at your company? Uh, so we also make action cameras. We've got our XL line of action cameras. A uh, really cool little 4K action camera for 199 bucks. It's got a viewing screen built onto the back. We make all the all the different accessories and everything to go with the uh, with the trail cameras, with the mounting, with the mounting and accessories for the XL line as well. Also, we've got some other little products on uh, on the website. You can go on and see. We've got a, a heated seat cushion, uh, some of the electronic earmuffs that, that dampen and muffle the sound with the microphone. Some some smaller odds and ends like that. But the uh, the bread and butter is is definitely the trail camera line. So how do people uh, find you on the web? Uh, so you can go to my Facebook page, which is uh, facebook.com slash the everyday outdoorsman. Uh, you can follow me on there. You can go to, uh, you know, obviously go on Instagram, Facebook, everything, and follow the Spy Point page as well. It's some really cool, just, you know, kind of daily pictures of uh, you can see what our users see. We've got some really good guides that are using our cameras now, and we can see some of their pictures on there. Um, uh, search me on Facebook. You can uh, you can email me. It's jhacker at spypoint.com if you have any questions or uh, look me up on there. And I'm sure we'll we'll put the links in the uh, links in the episode here too. Hey, well, Jake, thanks so much. This has been a been a blast, and uh, you know I learned I learned as I always do. I, I learn a little bit more, a little bit more, and it's fun for me because every time somebody says something, I go okay, and I apply it to the farm I hunt. You know, it, that's just how I do it. So I go, oh, okay. That makes sense. That makes yeah, that's, sense. That's the fun thing about whitetail hunt, man. You know, we're always learning, and there's there's nobody out there who can't teach you something, no matter how long you've been doing this. There's always always plenty to learn about whitetail hunting. That's for sure. You you got that. So on behalf of thousands, over almost two hundred fifty thousand listeners across North America, thanks so much, Jake, and and wish you well, and and we'll be in touch down the road. Yeah, thanks for having me, Bruce. I appreciate it. Hey, I really enjoyed the next show with Bob Smith uh, from Mason City, uh, Iowa. And uh, Bob is just a character, and he's a boyer, and he makes bows for people. And he has a small uh, niche, um, boutique, whatever you want to call it, custom um, bow operation that he'll make a, a bow for you based on your specifications. And why is he a hoot? Because he enjoys life. He's embracing life. And he he's creating... Um, traditional archery equipment that you can go out and harvest whatever you want to harvest. And the stories he shares about um, hunting the, um, the bluffs and the coolies along the Mississippi river in Northeastern Iowa are uh, quite insightful. And uh, what you hear about his six foot harvest. Yes. He had a, took a deer, pardon me at six yards. Pardon me. That's a misnomer six foot, uh, would be close in your lap like close but he took one at six yards on the ground so enjoy mr bob smith whose big stick archery can be found on the web thanks for joining us be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of whitetail rendezvous where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt until next time listen learn and succeed